Hi, this is Eric Brotman, CEO of BFG Financial Advisors in suburban Maryland. Uh, and I'm joined with three wonderful guests, Patty Haw, Tyler Tuggle, and Jill Snyder, for our program on caring for aging loved ones. Uh, navigating financial, legal, and healthcare decisions, it's something many of us face um, in, uh, in families uh, across the country. And so we're hoping this will be a lively conversation that'll provide some information, some ideas, uh, and hopefully some hope as well, because it, it can be a daunting subject uh, and we have a lot to cover. So I'd like to begin with an introduction for each person. Um, in terms of, uh, and uh, Sarah Losey's behind, uh, behind the scenes with us, she, there, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box uh, we will hold them to the end, and time permitting, we'll try and answer those. If we don't get to your question, uh, we will. there will be a form at the end that you can click on that will allow us to get back to you individually and personally, if need be. So uh, a little bit about BFG, for those of you who don't know us, um, we were started in 2003, um, and I've actually been in practice since 1994 here in the Baltimore metro area, and we do financial planning and wealth management for families across the country. Uh, a lot of our services revolve around multi-generational planning, legacy and estate planning. And one of the reasons why I know these good folks is that we wind up working together to help families, hopefully not families in crisis, hopefully families who are planning ahead to avoid crises. So um, there'll be more information about each of us as we go on, but I'd like our other panelists to introduce themselves. Jill, would you share a little bit about you and your practice? Sure. I'm Jill Snyder, and I have my own estates and trusts practice in Baltimore County, Maryland. It's law office of Jill A. Snyder, and I focus exclusively on uh, trust and estate planning, probate administration, and small business planning. And I've been at it for over 18 years in my own practice at this point. There's a lot of experience on this call, I can tell already. All right, Patty. <laughs> Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Patty Hall, I am the owner of Senior Care Partners. I have been helping families navigate the options of sometimes what I call the wacky world of senior living since uh, 2009, so heading into my 14th year. And I focus on everything from continuing care retirement communities to assisted living to memory care, everything in between. And just the, the goal is to help people uh, make the right decisions for them. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, Tyler. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Tyler Tuggle. I own the uh, Baltimore Home Instead Senior Care uh, Franchise Office. So we provide in-home companionship and personal care in the Baltimore area. Uh, I acquired this franchise in 2009, or 2019, so I'm coming up on uh, five years of ownership. Um, prior to that, I was a military veteran and a business strategy consultant, um, which, which fits in, we do we still do a lot of work with the Veterans Administration and, and making sure they're taken care of. Terrific, so now that we've met everybody, we're gonna take the slideshow down uh, so that this can be more of a, a conversation. Of course, we have our slide for the legal team. There's the legal department slide, enjoy. Uh, Sarah, if you'll take that down, now we can just have a conversation and. Um, what I'm going to do is try to facilitate a conversation um, that will that will um, that will bring each party into this in different ways. And and I'd like to start, Jill, with you because um, I think a lot of the planning for taking care of aging loved ones should begin a long time before anyone is aging. And so you really probably are the first person to get involved of, of all of us, or maybe you and I. Um, Share a little bit about what some maybe basic estate documents and, and other considerations need to be, particularly when it comes to helping make decisions financially or medically for your parents or loved ones. Okay, so yes, in an ideal world, everyone would come to me well in advance of needing these documents. And you know, for all who play a part in trying to encourage that, I definitely appreciate it. But uh, when you do your estate planning, uh, typically people plan for both death and incapacity. The death documents the will. It says who's in charge. It says where your stuff goes. It can control distributions to beneficiaries. It can deal with guardianship if, if that's um, something that's applicable to your situation. And the other documents are the documents that affect you if you're alive but not able to make decisions. So those are the ones people should really care about because it affects them while they're living. One of those is the living will for their own end of life decisions. Really, I consider that to be the guilt reliever so that people um, let people know what their intentions are at the end of their life if they can't communicate them. 
And then there are your two powers of attorney. There's a healthcare power of attorney for your healthcare, more day-to-day -day medical decisions. The most important part of that document these days is the HIPAA release that's incorporated into it. And then arguably your most important document is the financial power of attorney that allows somebody to access your assets and manage things for you if you're alive but not able to do so because otherwise people won't have access even to take care of you. So essentially folks, once they're 18 years old should consider having financial and medical powers just because parental rights go away. Is that a fair statement? Each of my kids got it for their 18th birthday. <laughs> there you go. There you go. My daughter's not quite 18 yet, but uh, but we'll be on top of that for sure in a, in a couple of years. So um, some of the planning that goes on in advance is is certainly financial and some is legal. And one of the things that people ask about a lot that our clients ask about is how are we, not the logistics, but how are we going to pay for this? You know, it, it used to be folks retired at 65, they lived to 72. Now people could live to be 107 and uh and families used to all be in the same community and now folks are all over the country even all over the world and so that creates a new nuance and one of the solutions that is definitely not the only solution but one of them is long-term care insurance which some people think oh this isn't for me or it's only for older people or um, it is certainly a solution but there are other ways to do some of the funding. So what I'd like to do is shift gears here a little bit and talk about some of the care options. And if we can start with some of the costs, I wanna get this out of the way because I know it scares people <laughs> to death. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's horrifying to think of, it's like paying for a college education every six months for your mom or something like that. So talk a little bit about, and Patty, we'll start with you. Talk a little bit about um, facility care options and the wide range from hopefully more modest to Rolls-Royce expensive. Yeah, sure. So um, it is one of those things that most people do not plan for. And it is also, Eric, as you know, the thing that you can't take a loan for, right? Mm -hmm. You can take a loan for education and a house and all these things, but you can't get a loan for your care. So we'll start at, I guess we'll start at the top. So the option is um, a continuing care retirement community. People often hear CCRC for short. Um, they also make that synonymous with a buy-in. So you'll hear the buy-in, oh, it's a buy-in community. Well, what does that mean? It means that you do put down an amount upfront, you have to financially qualify, but once you're financially accepted, you can age in place there through independent living, assisted living, and nursing home care. If you are unable to pay for your care while you're there, you do not have to leave. They cannot ask you to leave for financial reasons unless you do something stupid. Let's just say you don't. Um, so that's, that's the one that people love, and it does provide a lot of peace of mind to individuals not knowing that they don't have to worry about how am I going to pay for 12 or 13, 14 thousand dollars at high level of you know of assisted care. The next one would be kind of more of a supportive independent living. Then we go to assisted living. Memory care is kind of part of that. And then of course the nursing care, which people use nursing home. We like to say skilled nursing facility. So with the CCRC, that really depends on your age, but you have to have some significant assets right, um, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars with some good income depending on your age. If you're a couple, you know, go beyond that. Assisted living, generally speaking, if you want like a larger community, private room with all the fun amenities, you're looking at six thousand up. There are some monthly, lower- that's monthly, six thousand a month. Yes, yes, lower um, monthly. There are lower options that we, we call residential assisted livings. They look like houses, feel like houses, are houses are still licensed, they can be anywhere from like 2,500 a month on up as well. Um, and then of course, memory care is usually around 8,000, 9,000 these days. And then of course, nursing home care, we all know is 10,000 on up. Well, and, and nursing home care comes with it a stigma that I, I remember my great grandparents in nursing home facilities that um, that, that could still give me nightmares today if I allowed it. Like it really was a scary time as a kid to see um, a, a loved one in a situation that was really not ideal. Um, a lot of people are contemplating ways to not have to leave their homes. And the idea of in-home care has proliferated and there are, there are offices and agencies and organizations that do this. And of course, finding somebody you're comfortable to be with your mom or dad or even yourself if you're in a position where you know that's coming 
um, can be a daunting thing. So Tyler, talk a little bit about the options for folks who would rather be able to age in place, um, to, to stay in their homes potentially, and to have the, the different types and different levels of care, and again, the different costs of care because they can range a lot, I believe. Sure, so we provide in-home care for uh, seniors, which uh, means we provide either you know companionship caregiver or personal caregiver that could be a certified nursing assistant that will go into the senior's home um, and provide whatever level of care they need. So we range from as little as 10 hours a week uh, all the way up to 24 seven care. And of course the cost varies widely with how much care is needed. Um, so one of the things we see is, you know, most seniors start needing care while they're in the home. You know, very few go from being a, a 100% capable and independent to, you know, directly into nursing care or assisted living. Um, but a lot of times the care is provided by a family member, family, family caregiver. Um, so once it gets to the point where more care is necessary, um, like I said, we start at 10 hours a week. Um, you know, that could be maybe mom or dad just needs to go to uh, uh, some appointments, need some help grocery shopping, wants, would like someone to help go on walks with them. Um, so at that rate, so at the lowest level of care, and again, this will vary based on uh, home care agency. Um, but in, in our area, the, the Baltimore area, at least, you're looking between $30 and $40 an hour for, for care for a full service agency. Um, and so at our minimum, you know, 10 hours, 10 hours a week, um, you're probably looking at around 15 to $1,700 a month um, okay. for care. Um, now, if you go all the way up, and I, um, I think Patty may speak to this later, we'll talk about it. Um, as you go up in care, and if you do need, uh, you know, one-to-one -one aid for uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, that cost is going to be upwards of $20,000 a month if you're going with a, a full service agency. Um, so some of the ways on, on that cost, and, and Eric, stop me if you want to get to this later, but some, some of the, the payers for the, the cost, I know you mentioned long-term care insurance. Um, those policies, while they've, they've changed in recent years, you can still get uh, long-term care riders on most life insurance policies. Um, which, of course, the earlier you get those policies, the, the less you're going to be paying a month. Um, there are programs, as I mentioned, through the Veteran Administration. There are several programs for veterans to provide them with uh, certain levels of care. Uh, those programs can be uh, income-based, um, much like Medicaid. Uh, most states provide Medicaid options as well. For You're not going to get 24-7 care, but you can get several hours a week to, to help the senior. Um, and yeah, that's generally the, the gist of what we do. I will say one thing, we also uh, don't just provide care in the homes of seniors. Uh, well, what we say is home is wherever the senior is living safely and, and happily. So that could be in one of the CCRCs that, that Patty mentioned. And they're, they're, um, we, we have had clients that we followed through the, the care spectrum, whether it, um, you know, as, as their needs progress, maybe they start out in the family home and then downsize and go to independent living, but still want a little one-on-one -on -one care uh, as they move to assisted and, and even skilled nursing. Um, so, you know, we can kind of scale up or down based on where the client's living as well as what the specific needs are. So, so I'm hearing a couple of common trends, but the first thing I want to point out is the one thing I'm not hearing, and this is good, um, people believe that Medicare is going to pay for their long-term care expenses. It's not. Um, there is a very small amount of money available for the first 20 days and then an even smaller amount for the next 80. And then Medicare is not picking up the tab for any long-term care expenses, any of, of these types of things. So um, it's real important not to assume that you're on Medicare and therefore you're fine. Um, that is that is for that is more general health insurance. It is not long-term care. So I, I wanted to throw that out just to make sure, because all of you talked about the, the different costs and no one mentioned Medicare, and that's because Medicare is not an option to pay for this. For, so for folks over 65 on Medicare, that is not the solution. Uh, Medicaid can be a solution, although it's, it's a, um, I think, a, a last resort type of, of, uh, of option. It's certainly not anyone's first choice for themselves or their loved ones. So what I am hearing, though, is 
that this requires an enormous amount of capital um, and or income, which means planning ahead. You don't just wake up one day and decide, yes, this, this is gonna fall into my budget, no problem. Um, and so I think some of it starts with the work that, that our team does and the work that Jill's team does, because you begin with the planning when you were much younger. Tyler mentioned you know, buying insurance vehicles when you're younger. That certainly makes sense within reason. Um, but planning ahead and knowing that there's gonna be some portion of your retirement savings that needs to be earmarked or at least available for this kind of scenario. Patty, how do you see people uh, when they're doing, for example, the buy-in scenario, does that usually come from the sale of their residence or are there other ways that you see that happen? So Eric, that's a great question. Most people that I come across, their number one asset is their home. Um, if, if they've treated it well, meaning if they haven't taken a second mortgage and they still have outstanding debt or a reverse mortgage, it is often used as part of that financial plan. Sometimes it's enough and sometimes they need that and then some. But yes, the home is usually the, the best asset when people are needing to leave the house to get their care or just to downsize for re, you know maintenance-free retirement living. Like who doesn't want to be on a cruise ship that never leaves the dock? You know, that's, that's kind of what retirement living is in many of these CCRCs, they're beautiful. I've heard of people who actually are on cruise ships that do leave the dock, that I, that's how I they know. spend their retirement. And because of the medical care on board, it can be less expensive than living in your own home. There's a lot of articles being published about that of late. It's something to consider, maybe. I, I mean, if I can spend my last 10 years cruising the world, that doesn't sound terrible, actually. No. Um, so, Jill, let's talk about, in, in, in your case, the way you help people frame these conversations, because certainly the financial aspect of it, it may not be your first priority, but you want to preserve and protect assets. We want to think about how assets are titled between married people. Um, folks have said, well, why don't we just do some gifting? Because boy, that's going to solve the problem. Then we've we've reached a certain level. What are you seeing in terms of um, in terms of best practices for families who are trying to navigate who's gifting and who's paying and who's who's doing what? Who's responsible financially? Probably the most important takeaway that I can provide is that the families need to have these conversations um, with their children, you know, and parents, regardless of whether the child initiates or the parent initiates. But the last thing that that you know anybody wants is a surprise that or or missed expectations that the parents, you know, assume that their kids are that they put through school or their retirement plan <laughs> are kids <laughs> thinking that the parents have plenty of money and will hopefully not only be able to support themselves, but leave money for them at the end of the process. Mm. So, you know, you have to have those hard conversations and realistic conversations. There are times when um, discussions of Medicaid planning comes into the discussion of um, whether to consider uh, Medicaid as a potential for paying for nursing home level of care in the future. And, you know, as I hear from people and as you've indicated, it seems to be more of a, a means of last resort rather than the desired outcome that they hope that the government will pay. That, you know, people would much rather have control over where they choose to go and how their care is delivered rather than being restricted to just what would be available through Medicaid. But there are times when that's an appropriate discussion um, in, in terms of figuring out how to pay. You know, as a planner, I think the earlier you get on it and set aside, you know, either funds separately or that you um, have long-term care that you purchase while you're young and healthy um, goes a long way to relieving everybody's stress about what's ahead. And even if the long-term care that you purchase won't cover everything, at least it can limit your exposure um, to a manageable amount. So it doesn't have to be an all or none option you can still purchase something to just mitigate the risk of of what's ahead financially when i think about long-term care i think about it as much for the healthy spouse as for the less healthy spouse because if you're in a marriage and one of you gets sick yes the presumption is your healthy spouse will help take care of you but there are certain things that go beyond what a family member can provide memory care for instance is a, a serious issue with that um, but there's also the possibility that you could bankrupt your healthy spouse if you're not careful by spending down all of your, so the idea of having some pool of money, whether it's assets that you've earmarked, whether it's insurance dollars or other things, so that there's enough 
you know, in my situation, there's enough money to care for me without bankrupting uh, my widow who, you know, women tend to outlive men by seven years, I believe on average. And men a lot of times marry women younger than them. I'm not naming any names, but when that happens, um, a lot of times um, somebody can be widowed for a very, very long time. And so you need to make sure that you're not damaging his or her dignity in terms of, of retirement as well. So when families buy into a facility or couples buy, I should say, buy into a facility, typically both spouses would go because the levels of care vary, right, Patty? So you can have the, the one spouse living mostly independently, but the other one needs more help. That's available at the same time, correct? Yeah. So Eric, um, you know, couples are always a little tricky, right? Because it really comes down to what each of them would define as their quality of life, right? And usually what we find with couples is I call it, they're at bookends. What one is pretty healthy, maybe still very vibrant, and the other one, for whatever reason, has failed a little bit faster, right? Needs something going on. So in those cases, um, we have couples that will move in together into either independent living, sometimes they move into assisted living together because financially it might make more sense. I've even had couples, not a lot, but often enough that have moved into a memory care room together because financially wow. it was less expensive than having two separate rooms. And the one who was stronger could not be the caregiver, right? Mm. They just needed someone else to be that caregiver. So it really comes down to what works. And financially, at the end of the day, they got to make that money go as long as they can, to your point right? Because when one survives the other, you better be able to pay for your care. Mm -hmm. So when you have a situation in independent living, which Tyler kind of alluded to, you're always, someone's always the caregiver, even in independent living, unless you use third-party care to come into your apartment, mm -hmm. right? So personally, you have to say, can I continue giving my loved one the care that they need? And if the answer is no, then you have to either get that care to come in and supplement your care, or you need to go to the next higher level of care, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that's with that person or you remain separate depends on financially what you can afford. If you are in a CCRC, then yes, there is that opportunity to kind of age a little bit farther and still be together. There's a lot of that opportunity in what I call um, senior rentals too, like a okay. bright view or something like that. So couples are complex. They all depend um, because caregiver stress is a real thing. And oh, yeah. it can cause the healthy one to decline faster than the one who you were caring for. Well, I find both personally and professionally um, instance after instance where the healthy spouse really resists getting any kind of care into the home. Even if they have yep. the means for it and everything, I think that they just feel that they're duty bound and it's their responsibility and they push themselves too far and too thin. And a lot of time it's the children really pushing the healthy spouse to say, you're not gonna be any good to anybody if you don't take care of yourself and take yes. a little bit of um, help along the way. Yeah, it's you're funny. right, Jill. Jill. Jill read my mind. You read my mind. Yeah. That was sorry, Patty. Jill read my mind. My next question was actually for Tyler about that is that are you seeing resistance when there is one spouse who's healthy and, and active and able and uh, and one spouse who really needs some extra care? You know, Jill, you called it the, the I, what was it, the guilt-free factor or the, 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 it was like a permission slip to not be guilty because you, you've given the responsibility or the, the information in the document. But Tyler, are you seeing couples who um, really resist having help in the home while there's a healthy spouse there? Because to Patty's point, the, the, the impact on caregivers is severe. Yes, and, and we do see resistance, although I'll say primarily you know, if I had to say where we see it the most, it, it is generally from the, the parent that needs the care um, or the, the family member that, that does need the care. Because I think there's something, um, you know, there there's a, a need for some acceptance when we're going to bring an outsider into the home to provide care, because that's really one of the first steps of, of saying, OK, I'm no longer truly independent. Um, so we see this a, a lot, whether it's 
and I don't want to just say I'm the healthy spouse as well, but also with the adult children where they start really leaning on the, the family members because that's just, that's more palatable than, you know, like, like I said, admitting that that we need a, a third party to, to come into the house. So there, there are a lot of discussions um, that, you know, need to be had with, within the family of, of explaining. And uh, Patty, I'm going to steal one of your lines. You know, you've, you've, we, we've talked about where you say, you know, as the, the family caregiver, what's the actual quality of the time you're spending with a, with a loved one? Are you spending all your time actually working and taking care of them? Or you have the ability to spend time visiting and socializing and, have, you know, knowing that someone else is taking part of the care? Um, so those are all conversations that need to be had you know, within the family. And and Eric, before we move on too far from the cost and kind of resources, I do want to mm -hmm. mention for in-home care, um, home equity is also a viable option for in-home care as well. Um, through uh, now with reverse mortgages and how, how they're operating. And I know there's a stigma around them. So I do want to be careful and, you know, make sure reverse mortgages are great options for some people or really bad options for, for other people. Um, but we do have an increasing number of, of clients that are going the, the reverse mortgage route. It allows them to access the equity in their home while staying there. Um, some of the misconceptions are if, you know, if you're alive and the term of the reverse mortgage runs out, you're not going to be ejected from your home. Uh, your spouse won't be ejected from your home. Um, so that's just something and every, I, without getting into the details of it, because you could spend an hour talking about them. Um, I do anyone looking at resources should look into it and see if it's a good option for them as well. So, Patty, I cut you off a few moments yes, ago. I, I, I wanted you to make sure you, you got in that thought if it hasn't uh, if it hasn't fled you. Um, no, Tyler, Tyler covered it. Um, it is not always just the spouse needing help. It is sometimes the the person needing help is resistant in and of themselves. Right. So if they're living alone, they think everything's great because really the family is swirling around them and they're providing the assistance. So it's always a difficult conversation um, having, getting people to acknowledge that they need some help coming in. So and we've respite been care out, works great. We've been throwing out words like care and help mm -hmm. and other words without really defining what that looks like. I know that the conversations I've had with my own parents are uh, and with clients are it's different for me to show up at the house with groceries and to help pay some bills than it is to give mom a shower. And, you know, just just understanding and visualizing what some of those challenges are, if you're having trouble, if you're having trouble taking care of yourself at that level, um, it, parents don't want their kids to see them that way. Kids don't want to see their parents that way. Um, and it creates an enormous amount of challenge. And, and of course, families do what they have to do. Let's face it, we're, we're adult people, we do what we have to do. But given the choice, um, are those the kinds of things, are those the kinds of conversations that, that you all are seeing, any of you are seeing um, in the planning process of what kind of levels of care and what types of things of services are being provided? Uh, and Tyler, start with you. Is that is that the kind of thing that it's it's really like a laundry list of the types of services and, and you get into that granular detail with folks? Sure. Yeah. Yes, we do. And we have clients, you know, as I mentioned, on all levels of the, the care spectrum. So generally low hour clients or you'll start out with just companionship care that's keeping mom and dad engaged. Like I mentioned, going on walks, getting groceries, playing games, um, escorting to, to appointments. Uh, so that's the, the first level. Um, and then you move up as, as you progress into personal care, which is what covers uh, what are known as ADLs or activities of daily living. Um, so those are the more hand, that's the more hands on care, uh, toileting, bathing, grooming, um, um, anything that in the, just kind of a rough delineation between the two. What we tell clients generally anything that requires you to touch the the senior skin is falls on the, the ADL side. Um, and then you go all the way up to, um, you know, the highest levels of care and 24 seven care is generally reserved for people with dementia. You know, they may be wander risks um, or, or around the clock fall risks and stuff like that. Those are, that's generally what's needed when you go up to, to 24 seven. 
So there's a, a definite difference between uh, helping somebody go to the bathroom, helping somebody take a shower, mm -hmm. helping somebody eat. Um, that's not necessarily the same as skilled nursing care, correct? I mean, there's there's intermediate levels of care. There's there's so much jargon in the industry. Patty, can you talk a little bit about the different levels of care and let's let's demystify some of the jargon that you use. Like, what is skilled care versus intermediate care versus respite care versus custodial care? I mean, there's so many terms and I, I don't know about you, but I think it's daunting and I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, so it, the lines are in some ways they blur over the years, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there was a time when, for example, a feeding tube, if you had a feeding tube, there was a time when that could only be done a in your house because a family member would do that for you, or it was a skilled nursing need, right? A skilled nursing need. Now, there are some assisted livings that will do feeding tubes for you, right? Not all of them, but some do. So even in the industry, Eric, the, the lines are, are blurring, right? Um, so the levels of care, um, you know, for assisted living, there are three levels of care. It's all by point system. It all comes down to how much personal time does someone need, right? Kind of a off to what Tyler was saying about mm -hmm. how much care someone needs. When you get into the nursing home level of care, it's a little bit more complex, right? So it's someone who needs a lot of all of that, right? So they need help with everything in their life, right? Okay. Bathing, toileting, transferring, dressing, feeding, right? And or also maybe they're medically compromised. So maybe there's some medical issue going on, um, diabetes that's out of control, yeah, things of things of that nature. I can tell you in the world of assisted living, that line is somewhat blurry. Um, there are some technical things, not to be such a downer, but like wounds and things like that. Certain stages of those are skilled care, right? You, you have to be in a skilled nursing home to kind of take that level of care, but the rest of it can be fairly independent. What I tell people that I talk with is, when you're looking at a nursing home or you're thinking your loved one needs a nursing home, they better need a lot of care. And you know it when you see it, okay. right? So someone who um, can get up and walk around and make themselves some lunch and you know do those types of things, they're not nursing home care, right? Okay. It is, think about it. I was a Girl Scout. We used to go into the nursing homes and sing and carol. We all have a vision of what that was, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. right. And, and that's still pretty much true because they have medical people nursing 24 hours. They have medical capabilities. Assisted livings are cus what we call custodial care. They do not, they can't do medical type of stuff, even though medication management is what they can do. Right. Um, you can get physical therapy in, a, in a, an assisted living but it's through Medicare that you're getting those services. Um, maybe the best way to say it is whatever you can get in your home by either a loved one or a, a third party provider, that's what you're getting in assisted living plus the socialization. Does that make sense? It's, it, it does. It's so the nursing not home as is clear really more as you a, like it to be. A nursing home is more of a hospital than almost. At, it at has a, a medical model. It is a medical okay. model for sure. Assisted livings all say they are social models. They are not medical models. Okay, so we, we've now we've now had the the term feeding tube used on this. So you know how uplifting <laughs> this has been for everybody. Uh, but, <laughs> Sorry, but Jill, I wanna, Jill. I want to throw this out to you real fast because um, I am reasonably certain that I made sure my document said, "Don't ever give me a feeding tube. <laughs> give me pain medication and let me go." Um, Jill, how do we how do we navigate those wishes? Some of them being a little gruesome, actually. But how do we determine, or how do you help clients understand the different choices that they need to make on the medical side? Okay, that's a good question. So the first thing I want to start with is to indicate that there's a legal document and a medical document, and they have crossover, but they're not the same, and it's commonly confused. So we lawyers, for good reason, should not be giving medical advice. So um, we have to stay in our lane and what we can provide is something called a living will. Some people refer to it as an advanced directive, which is, um, includes the living will and the healthcare power of attorney. And the living will says 
after two doctors certify, you're at the end of your life and there's no expectation of recovery and you can't communicate your wishes anymore. At that point, you can determine whether you would, um, you could give your directions in advance for whether you would just want to be kept comfortable at that point, you know, get the hospice care and the morphine drip, or whether you would still want feeding tubes or breathing tubes or other artificial means of being kept alive. What confuses people when they walk into me, they say, I want a DNR, meaning a do not resuscitate order. That's not what a living will is. A living will, they're still going to try everything first and only after there's no expectation of recovery um, or, or improvement, uh, even if there is care given, that's when the living will kicks in. Maryland has replaced the do not resuscitate order with a broader form called a MOLST form, Maryland Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. And that's something that you need to get from a doctor. It's a doctor's order that gets signed. And it talks about this kind of stuff, but in more medical detail, where you can actually direct, don't give me cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Don't give me dialysis. Don't give me blood transfusions. Don't give me um, chemotherapy. So that's not the purpose of a living will. Uh, that's something that, you know, those details are things that have to be discussed with your doctor. And um, often it's done when people are admitted to a hospital, um, those questions are answered. It would be better if you make those arrangements and talk to your doctor ahead of time when you're not in crisis trying to answer those questions. So from a practical perspective, um, your, your spouse is having a cardiac event and you call 911 and they're taken by ambulance to the local hospital and now it's emergency room care immediately, right? what physician is going to have time to figure out what those like aren't aren't they in the emergency room setting going to do everything they can to preserve and restore life no matter what those things said because they don't have time to sit and research that there's like isn't there a level yes. of care that from an emergency standpoint we're going to do everything possible and then once once there's stability then we'll figure out what was supposed to happen um, yes, that's often the case. The idea, though, with the MOLST form when it came into play was that it's supposed to follow you through different medical facilities. So it, it is in the hospital, it goes to the rehab, it ends up in the nursing home, and it's supposed to follow you. Whether that has actually been implemented um, you know, in a smooth way, I can't really say, but I have my guesses. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, so, Eric, yeah, if I can just interject please. there, that most form, um, Jill, thanks so much for talking about that. That most form is required before anyone can move into an assisted living or memory care. Hmm. And that, and to Jill's point, that if you have to go out 911, that that form goes goes with. In fact, when the when the paramedics come, that form is produced so that they know what steps they can and cannot take for that individual. Hmm. So it has replaced the DNR in that fashion, and it is a required form before admission. Okay, but I have had clients that have been very, I'm sorry. Tyler, let, let Tyler get a word, and he's he's been no, very patient. So, yeah, so, sorry. So what, one thing I just want to say to, to Jill's point are if the forms are following them or not. Um, when we intake new clients, and I suggest everyone do this with their loved ones, are you need to have copies of those forms in the home, and every family member needs to know where they are. They don't do anybody any good if they're in a drawer somewhere and no one knows the location of the of, of the form. So that's uh, that that's just one thing we and we, and we get it all the time when when we're onboarding new clients. They all tell us they have POAs and they have all you know all, all they're all taken care of. And then we ask them where it is and no one you know take, it takes them a week to put it together. And for Pete's sake, don't put your will or any of the documents like that in a safe deposit box. <laughs> because Shocks. the will is going to be the person who's, that's going to be the document that says, here's who can access the box if I'm gone. And and I, I, that's off topic, but I, I've seen that kind of stuff before, and it's just not a good thing. And the same thing's true with the healthcare power. If your emergency healthcare power is in a fireproof safe in your basement, no one's getting to it when the time comes. It needs to be readily accessible, right? Yeah. Yes, the documents that I always tell people when I give them that that for, for most documents, legal documents, you just tell your family that you've completed them, where you keep them, and that I've got a set of them. The exception is that health care power of attorney. That's the one thing people may need quickly and should be distributed to the individuals who are named as agents and to the primary care doctor. Good advice. So 
Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how each of you work, because I know we've got um, we've got a, a varied audience interested potentially in in working with any of you. And and Patty, if I can start with you, tell us a little bit about um, how senior care partners works and how you're compensated and the the types of things that you would do with someone who who maybe was exploring this for themselves or their loved ones. Sure. Um, so I I bill myself kind of as a consultant, if you will. So um, over the 14 years, I understand through my great colleagues like Tyler how in-home care works. I know all about the assisted livings. I know about the CCRCs. So Eric, much like you or much like when someone works with a real estate agent, if they're starting to feel like my loved one has fallen, they're in the rehab again, or we want to you know, make a change, my job is to take their discovery, right? So I learn all about what's going on with them look at the financials, look at what's happening at the house, what's working, what's not working, where's the quality of life that they're missing, right? So I really look at the personal side of it. Then we get into the financial world and then we start talking about, well, here's how it sounds like you're going. So just like you would sit down and do any type of planning, that's the kind of the initial interaction I have with people that call. And sometimes they call in a crisis because look, we don't have a crystal ball right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other times they call proactively because they think something's coming. Um, my, I, I focus most on placement side of aspects, but again, I want to make sure that whatever they decide is the right thing for them. And if they need other resources, I'm happy to point them in the right direction. Um, my placement services actually are complementary to the family. There are times though, to be full disclosure, that I do have a fee for service, just depends on the situation. But you, generally speaking, I love to give back to those that are in this situation. I always say if I would have known then what I know now about my own grandparents, and you know that, Eric, from when I got into this business, um, some of that would have gone very differently, very differently. And it's a lot about dispelling what people think, the connotation of a nursing home in this generation. They think that's all they have. No, they have other things. So I like to just kind of be that coach you know, that can help direct people. If I can't help them, I'm directing them out to the best source. Excellent. And Tyler, how, how does your operation work by comparison or, or uh, similarly? Sure. And and I should say there are also not all home care is created equal. So it's, um, you know, it's really important for, for people to understand exactly what they're paying for um, when they use an agency or some people might have a private caregiver that they pay directly um, or versus using a registry to find a caregiver. So um, at Home Instead, what we do, we, we consider ourselves a full service agency. Um, we do bill hourly and that's how most of the home care agencies will, will bill at an, at an hourly rate. Um, we, all, all of our caregivers are W-2 employees. Uh, they're all employed directly by us. We do background checks, drug screens. Uh, they fall under our insurance um, if anything were to, were to happen. Um, so it, we also, if a caregiver is to call out, we'll make sure you get a replacement. We'll pull another caregiver in there temporarily to make sure you, you get the, your loved one gets the care they need. Um, so for that, you are paying a little bit more for the full service agency. Um, so then the other option, so I'm sure people have seen commercials for like caring.com and some of the websites that are coming up, which they act, we uh, we refer to those as registries. So they'll have, if uh, you think of them like the Uber of the home care space, they're just matching people who need care with a caregiver that's, um, you know, has the availability and wants to provide it. Um, so one thing to think of with those options is you, you pretty much pay a, a finder's fee for the registry. Um, they'll provide the caregiver, the, the individual will need to pay them directly, um, which if things don't work out, you're going back to the registry and they're finding someone else. So uh, paying a caregiver directly does tend to be cheaper, but it also comes with increased risks. Um, primarily, and one thing a lot of people don't realize, if you pay a caregiver directly, you're effectively their employer, which means you should be deducting payroll taxes, uh, you should be paying for workman's comp, 
um, any liability, you know, you're liable if they get hurt on the job. So you're really increasing your risk profile. Um, also, in addition to that, if the caregiver decides not to show up or, you know, gets sick or, or has, has an incident, um, you're not, you know, there, there's no one for you to fall back on to provide a new caregiver and to get care. So that's that's kind of the different levels of, of home care agencies. It, it's funny. You took the words out of my mouth also. So you guys are taking turns reading my mind, which is actually spooky. But I, I was going to ask about hiring a caregiver directly rather than using uh, an agency. And uh, it sounds like the upside is potentially being able to choose the exact person you want and to be able to build a relationship with that person, almost like you might with a nanny, quite frankly. Yeah. But the downside is now you have an employee in your home and there's some liability issues and some legal issues around that and employment issues. Uh, and so you have to weigh the pros and cons in your situation. Yeah. And and Eric, I would also mention while, you know, clients that sign on with us, you know, there, we don't have an infinite number of caregivers. We have a relatively large pool. Um, and so just because you sign on with a full service agency doesn't mean you're giving up all your choice. We still work with them to set the schedules. Uh, we try to match caregivers for personality as well as skill set. You know, like we say, when we get it right, the caregiver does feel like a, a member of the family. Um, and it's, you know, that that's just great, great to see when we have that perfect match. And if we if we make a match that's not a good fit personality wise um, and the, the client can always request a new a new caregiver and we'll go back to the drawing board and find a better, better match. So you're not giving up all all, all of your choice going with a, an agent. Got it. Excellent. Um, and Jill, how can folks how can folks work with you if uh, if they're looking to to do some of this planning in advance? What's the what's the time frame? What's the the best way to engage? And how do you typically work? So when I'm doing estate planning, I typically work on a flat rate basis. The way we do things is typically the client initiates contact, and we send out some homework for them to do to gather information on their personal situation and on their finances so that we can make our initial meeting most productive. And um, I don't charge for that initial consultation. That's the planning strategy meeting. And at that meeting, I um, am able to make specific recommendations after I learn their needs and let them know exactly what it would cost to proceed. If they choose to proceed, they pay a retainer. Um, I ask all the questions to draft documents to their specifications. And then um, two to three weeks later, we do a document review and signing. So it's you know not a terribly long process. Um, and really from the time that they meet with me, the work's on me. So it's really, you know, from, from the client perspective, it's, it's you know, starting the process is, is where all the work is, and then I'm stuck doing the rest of it. Um, when I'm doing probate administration or trust administration, that I do at an hourly rate because each circumstance is so unique that there's no way that I could bundle it into a flat rate and have it be fair um, to me and to the clients each time. So hourly seems to be the most fair. But I do want to point out that you know, the cost of not planning ahead. Um, I've gotten numerous, numerous calls. You know, my mom just had a stroke. I need a power of attorney or, you know, some some equivalent of, of that version where it's already too late in many respects. And, you know, if, if you're doing a power of attorney at the front end, it's costing you a few hundred dollars. If you don't have the option to get a power of attorney because the person no longer has capacity to understand and execute one, the only option for an individual to have access to their finances, to pay for their medical needs or to apply for Medicaid would be by going through a full-blown court-appointed guardianship, which is several thousands of dollars and time-consuming and easy to avoid. So it's really important to, to plan ahead, um, not just for peace of mind, but financially, it's a much better move. Well, we, we are kindred spirits in that way, Joe, because most of the work that we do um, at BFG is uh, we engage on a flat fee basis. We also do a consultation in advance that's usually 90 minutes to two hours. We charge nothing for that initial meeting because we want folks to be able to to, to determine whether we're the right group for them and whether we can help them and, and, and just to make sure it's a fit because ultimately it's a very personal decision. I mean, all of us are dealing with with people's families and their loved ones and their lives and their money and their and their health and it's it's a very intimate relationship any way you slice it. So um, I, it's it's nice 
for for our viewers to understand how each of us engages and how that works. Um, Sarah, we're running up against the end of our time. Are there any questions in the queue or if there are any uh, additional questions that you'd like to put into the chat box, we'd love to, to hear them now. Um, and if not, we'll let everyone have a, a closing remark. Sarah, anything in the chat box? Uh, yes. So our first question, how do you talk to parents about resistance? Ooh. Ooh, we could each talk, tell a story about that. Where, where should we begin? Anybody want to volunteer to go first? Nobody, okay, I'll so, go first. That oh, go ahead. Yeah, because I think that is resistance to care or resistance to getting like legal documents because I see it from a couple different angles. Like sometimes this people don't want to make during the care. Um, it, it came in when you're talking yeah. about getting care. So resistance to actually accepting yeah. care and help. Yeah, I figure this is up your alleys, pa uh, uh, Patty and Tyler, because uh, Jill and I, certainly we understand the resistance to getting financial advice or, or legal advice, sure. and some of it's a cost thing, and some of it's a we're too busy thing, and some of it's a we're never going to die thing, it's not going to happen to me anyway. Um, but in terms of, of the care, how do you deal with, with that, those conversations with people and their parents? Tyler, I'm happy to take a, yeah. uh, my perspective, and you want to jump in? Sure. So so my thought is, because it it comes up all the time, and I use the word depends a lot. Um, it it really depends on what the cognitive situation is with your loved one. It depends on your relationship with your loved one. If if they're having some cognitive issues, if there's some dementia going on, you need to take a different approach because they can't often remember what just happened. But if you tell them you're moving or you're bringing in care, trust me, they will remember that. It causes anxiety. <laughs> and they will constantly ask you, when am I moving? Why am I moving? Why am I moving? So it's always, I always suggest short bites of information, like, you know, bite-sized pieces. Um, focus on them. Focus on why things are can be better, whether it's getting help in the house so someone can get a respite, or it means getting into another environment for their safety, um, start slow, reinforce the love, reinforce we are not abandoning you, you are not a burden. You hear those phrases a lot. Um, mm -hmm. This is a gift. I always tell my clients, this is a gift that you're giving each other, right? It's, it's a gift, but quality time is a gift. If they are not cognitively impaired, then you, know, you can focus more on the, well, I see some things aren't working great for you here. Like, how could we work together? What ideas do you have that could help? And again, it takes time. Like, none of this is rocket science. I, you know, none of us have the magic fairy dust that you can wave and all, this, all of a sudden they're like, oh, yes, I need Tyler's people or I need to go to assisted living. Thank the Lord you, you gave me that answer. It, they're tough conversations and it really comes down to the relationship be as honest as you can be, but also compassionate when you're having that conversation. Before and, we get to Tyler's answer, just for the record, Jill does have the magic dust. I, I don't know where she got it, but she does have it. So, <laughs> all right, Tyler, what is your what is your take on that? Yeah, no, so I, I think Patty's spot on. And I think the hardest part of the conversation is the balance between, you know, not making your your parent or loved one feel like a burden but then also letting them know, you know, that you as the family caregiver could use some help. And, you know, maybe I see a lot of the resistance does come, um, it, it's because of financial reasons where the parent, you know, doesn't want to spend the, the child's inheritance, want, wants to have something to pass on. Um, I had a conversation, it was just last month, uh, with a, a gentleman um, who'd signed up with us. And then after the first shift, his mom went and let the caregiver in the house and said, you know, why do I need the caregiver? Uh, it's just costing money that's going to go to you. You know, you and your wife are taking care of me just fine by yourselves. And the, the gentleman was a CFO of a pretty large company, you know, had plenty of money. And the, his conversation with, with the mother was, was was mom I, I'm not worried about you know the financial burden of it I, and this is to Patty's point specifically I would rather my time with you be time with my mother not not time 
you know, spent taking care of someone. And by the way, my wife isn't working now because she's spending so much time taking care of you and, and doing that. So again, it's a difficult conversation because you don't want to make them feel like a, a, a burden. Um, but sometimes just explaining, you know, we, we see it all the time with parents. They just kind of take for granted that, uh, and, and when I grew up, my dad was the family caregiver from my grandmother and kept her at, at home, but spent, you know, I, a lot of, lot of hours on the, the weekends, a lot of time over at the at grandmother's house, keep, keeping her there, where if we had some of these options or known about it and it, it explained it, um, I, I, I think it, it would have, um, you know, would, would have helped with that, that transition. But I, I I just, I love, and Patty, I'll, I'll say it again. I want to give you credit for it because I've already told my staff and we use it all the time now <laughs> when we're talking to, you know, to the parents, do you want your time with mom and dad spent, you know, caring for the elderly or do you want it spent with a lot, you know, as quality time with a loved one? Can well, I address I, I the think... legal aspects of that, Eric? Uh, I, you you oh, most yes. certainly can. We are up against sort of the one minute warning. And so I, I, what I'd like to do, Jill, is um, if you'll make that part of your closing remark, we'll give each person one minute and then we've got to sign off. Um, Sarah, will you put the slide up with the uh, the QR code? Um, just to let everybody know, if you have interest in speaking with any of the four of us, you can use your, your cell phone to take a, a picture of this QR code. It'll take you to a very quick form that'll allow you to check a box or more than one if you'd like. And any of the four of us will be glad to do uh, a conversation with you and get in touch with you. And we would certainly love that. So Jill, I'll let you get in your last word first. Thank you. So I just wanted to address that, that it's a matter of knowing who the client is from my perspective. Cause sometimes I get calls from kids saying, I need a power of attorney for my mom. It's actually the mom that's the client. It's, you know, it's not the person who's being appointed as the agent who's the client. So that's the person that I need to speak to and make sure of what their needs are rather than the needs of the child. And then secondly, once you do have power of attorney, I do get questions and it's kind of complicated to navigate. What, what does that give them the authority to do? What if the parent does have capacity and doesn't want the help or doesn't want to move? Can you make them? And I would say the general answer is no. Of course, it's you know situation dependent, but but getting getting the legal document in your hand doesn't mean that that anybody loses rights in the process. Terrific, Tyler. Last word before we have to sign off. Yeah, I just think you know, there there are a lot of options out there for for senior care, and I just say it's not you know one size fits all solution. Um, for our care, as I say, we try to be as flexible as possible, but there there are times where we just, whether it's for a financial reason or maybe care needs and preferences, we're not the best fit. Um, you know, and then we'll gladly send people to to Patty so she can help them on the, the assisted living side. So I'll just say the type of care that you need and, and that's best, it, it is very, very personal um, and, and just something that, that everyone needs to think you know, one, it's obviously what can I afford? And then two, what are we looking to to get out of this and what's our end goal? Terrific. Patty, last so, word. Yeah, so Tyler said it all. So can I just say a quote from our first lady, Rosalind Carter? There are only four kinds of people in this world. Those that have been caregivers, those that are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. There's lots of options. There's no one path. Prepare for change every step of the way. Nicely done. And I, I will take the host last word and just say that the, the keys that I'm hearing from everybody, number one is open communication and the right levels of communication and frankly, the right timing of that and starting soon. Um, having these discussions with loved ones before there's a crisis, before there's an event, uh, before there's a need, uh, I think makes sense. And whether that's financial or legal or medical or relational, um, at the end of the day, I do think it makes sense for, for families to communicate in a in a very open way with one another. And I, I hope that's what will happen. So uh, for Patty Haw and Tyler Tuggle and Jill Snyder, I'm Eric Brotman. I thank you for listening today. Uh, remember, you can use that QR code on your screen to request that one or more of us get in touch with you. We're delighted to do it. Uh, we're all local here in the Baltimore Metro region and happy to speak with as many of you as you'd like. And I thank you for spending time with us today and I hope this was helpful to you and to your loved ones. And I wish you all a great day. Take care.